Uh, let's start the meeting. Are you ready? Great. Um, start the meeting for the October 16th, um, 2024, uh, Montpelier Rocks Bulleary, um, Board of School Directors. Uh, and the first order of business is public comment. Um, public comment is an opportunity for uh, the board to get input from the public on either something on the agenda or any else other thing that you want to bring to our attention. Um, we do not respond in real time. It's a time for you to talk and for us to listen, uh, but we take the input very seriously um, and certainly um, look into to matters that require further investigation and certainly put it into our input in terms of overall decision making, particularly if it's on you know broader topics such as you know, budget priorities or or whatnot. Uh, so if we do not respond in real time, it's not because we're not listening and we are listening and listening very intently. Um, and also, if you are someone who is uncomfortable giving public comment via, uh, via a speech, because I know it can be a little nerve wracking, um, we always take uh, any sort of input uh, via email at schoolboard at mpsvt.org. So with that, um, Everyone in the room seems to be on the agenda. Uh, so, uh, anyone online who'd like to? Um, yeah, looks like okay. Um, so, next order is consent agenda. The consent agenda is uh, basically uh, kind of pro forma matters that the board uh, approves without any discussion because they really don't require discussion. It's a way for us to get a lot of business done quickly. Um, and if there's something that a board member feels requires discussion, um, they can ask for the matter to be pulled off the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion <laughs> to approve the consent agenda? Do you have the consent agenda? Do you have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion or um, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, Next student presentation, if you have a student presentation to give. Excellent. Hold one second. You're on. Awesome. Um, we're presenting um, just a presentation about what goes on at MHS that not everyone might know about. So they don't, you know, go to the school or hear about it through the news. Excellent. Something big that's coming up soon is the fall harvest celebration. We do a fall harvest celebration every year, but going on at least as long as I've been here. I don't actually know how long, but it's a tradition. Um, this year's, I believe, is on Thursday, October 24th, um, and instead of going to class, we do enrichment activities all day, um, get to know some new people, and we get to eat lunch in the gym with our TAs. There's really good food. Last year, it was like minestrone soup. It was amazing. And I believe that school board members are welcome to come, so if you're free that day and you want to come hang out with everybody. School board members can be the judge if you talk to Anna Blackburn. Yes, so we have competitions to give you all. Every TA has a theme for their table. They're quite elaborate. I was yeah, <laughs> it gets very competitive. <laughs> Something that um, MHS does is peer tutoring. Um, so the MHS Club Action leads the program every year, and I believe you know sometime in September or October. Um, you know, there are forms that go out first about like anyone who wants to be a tutor and like what subject. Um, and then the form goes out to ask students if they would like a tutor. And it's just a really great way for students to get help from like their own peers. If, you know, one teacher can't help every single person when you need it. Um, and it's just a great way for students to get help when they need help like right away or, you know, more often than one teacher can provide. And um, yeah, right now Club Action is like matching tutors right now. And I think it's starting soon if it hasn't already started. Yeah, I tutored chemistry last year and I'm tutoring um, AP US history this year. And it's been like a really good experience because it makes me feel like 
I can help people with the knowledge that I've gained. And it also just like, I met some people that I wouldn't have otherwise. And I think it's a really cool thing that we do here. Um, I, if Natalie was here, she could probably talk about this better, Jill, but um, I went to mask. They have a new director this year. And this year, the students are putting on Hades Town together with U32, and they went to the Flynn in Burlington today to see it, which I heard was super cool. And auditions for Hades Town were yesterday. So when it happens, you should definitely come see it. Sports. A uh, big part of MHS, and it's really fun to participate and watch every season. Um, unfortunately, the fall season is coming to a close. This is the last week of the regular season for all sports, I believe. Playoffs start next week. And um, girls soccer is not the highest ranked this year. We're currently 14th, actually, in D2. Gonna that changed. <laughs> um, the boys are currently ranked five, but should go up if they win today. Um, and hopefully the boys will have a home playoff game this year and we will be on a, on the road, but it's a really great time for people to come out no matter how lovely or not lovely the weather is. Girls field hockey. We only have a girls field hockey team here and they're second in division three right now. So they have a pretty good shot at those. Yeah. yeah. They have a good chance at three peating this year. That's crazy to me. Um, girls volleyball is currently ranked 15 in D1, um, but Matt thinks that they still will get a home playoff game just because of how that division is set up. The boys team is ranked eighth in the state, um, and I believe it's their first varsity year or second. Yeah, var yeah first varsity year. Um, so it's very exciting for them. And cross country works a little different than all the other sports. We don't have playoffs. We are running the Northern Vermont Athletic Conference Mountain Division Championships at U32 this weekend. And the weekend after that, we're going to have state championships at Thetford. If you feel like coming to Thetford for some reason, we would love to have you. Um, and after that, hopefully the girls and boys teams will qualify for meet of championships, meet of champions at Burlington. Um, so our season is pretty close to a close as well. And that's all we've got. If you ever have questions about like what's going on at MHS, you can always come talk to us about it. We love to talk about the stuff that everybody's doing around here. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, no, thanks again. It's always great to learn um, what is going on. Um, so the fall assessment results. Uh, oh, sorry. I saw Scott's hand go up. Maybe not. Um, yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yep. Fantastic. Um, I just want to thank our student rep and and thank them particularly for the invite to fall um, the Harvest Fest. Um, I was invited last year, um, and I was so glad I, I joined, and so any of the board members who are able to, um, I strongly encourage. It's a, It's a great time. Thank you for that, Scott. Oh, putting your hand back up or down or? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Heard sorry. My phone. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, very excited to hear about the fall assessment results. And we have the all-star team here to present. And I understand his mic is not feeling well. Mike is not feeling well tonight, yeah, so. unfortunately. So he is not joining the team. Uh, but I think the team can answer any questions or will save the questions for Mike at another time. But I think we can probably answer most of them. Um, so the board received the data packet um or the data report in the packet um with uh the vcap results which we may or may not have supposed been supposed to been able to share but we decided to do so it's really small sorry you should have it right in yeah. front of you as well 
Um, just the overall from the VCAP scores. Now, remember, these these are taken in uh, March, the year before. So we received our scores over the summer. They're embargoed. They're technically still embargoed. Um, and we just received the state results, I think, a week and a half ago. Um, I believe that that link is in this report. Um, and you can see that in ELA, we did quite well um, compared to the state up in Usually we say that 5% is a statistically significant difference. And so we are scoring much higher than the average state numbers across the board. Um, most of these scores, uh, I can't remember exactly how many, but most of these scores did go up from last year as well or remain the same. ELA, we did not have too many slides from our VCAP or recap scores from one year to the next, which was good to see. Um, our math scores, we're looking at grade four and trying to figure out what happened with our grade four students the day they took this uh, assessment, um, because that seems to be an anomaly in the other scores, and we're not sure why. Um, it's also the lowest score from the statewide perspective, but that's certainly not the percentage we want to see in grade four in any way, shape, or form. So um, we're looking at that and trying to figure out what happened with our kiddos that that day. Um, our math scores are not as high as our ELA scores, obviously, and this is the area of focus. So um, if Mike had been feeling well, he would have been with a leadership team. I see Julie is on the line and Amy Kimball is as well. They all went to see um, Dr. Katir and Thunder today and yesterday around, or no, today and tomorrow um, around how to have a more robust math support services for kids. Um, which was highly anticipated event in Vermont because, as you can see with the statewide scores, um, many school districts are asking what's going on in math. So um, that is an area of focus across the state right now. I saw Jake with his hand up. Jake, do you want to stop and ask about VCAP scores now? Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. we can hear you loud yeah. and Jake. Yeah, I think they can hear you in uh, Middlesex. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to not talk so loud. No, we're um, just trying to get down yeah. here. Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> All right. Um, my question uh, to stop the momentum, but my question was actually on the first slide about enrollment. Um, where is that distribution? Um, like, does that does that mean that? in future years, like we're gonna have a lot fewer students or does something happen where like high school, more people will show up at in high school? I don't, I don't really know, but that looks like a downward trend. Um, yes. Yeah, that that's a really good question, Jake. We've had a bubble going through um, and that's the end of the bubble that you see there. Um, the high school students. At the high school, yeah. the high school yeah. students are the end of the bubble. Yeah. So that bubble has gone through our system that we've seen for a while. Um, but I'm really glad you asked that question, Jake, because in the um, master plan that Truex Collins did with us last year, they recommended that we do an enrollment study overall. And so we've hired, MRPS hired about two weeks ago, NESDEC which is a firm that does enrollment studies, enrollment projections for many school districts across the state and across the US actually. Um, and so we contracted with NESDEC to get a better um, picture around our enrollment data in the future. So we'll be, be able to predict that better. Um, it's something that I know U32 district or Washington Central has used. And, and I think Stephen was telling me that they're their predictions for like 15 years have been off by like five students. So they're a pretty accurate service for us. So we're looking forward to getting that information to see if our enrollment numbers are gonna continue to decline or if they're going even out or um, if they're even gonna increase. And we do pick up sometimes a few high school students, like people who come in from either private schools or homeschool. I mean, like not yeah. many, but maybe a handful. We Yeah, not a whole bunch, yeah. but we do. Um, not a whole bunch. Jason can probably talk, but go ahead, Jay. Um, Come up here, Jason. Going into the spring, we were projected to have 395. 
and I think we wound up with over 400, 407. 407. Yeah. So we got a big influx over the summer. Yeah. That's good. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my guess is, Jake, or maybe I, this is my question, the, the minus four and minus three, really, those are just like a best guess. The far left, the two far left right. bars. Those are our students who are either in our pre-K program uh -huh. or they're in, uh, they get Act 166 num money uh -huh. through MRPS. Um, and they're in a private program. Uh -huh. But if a parent, and you know, pre-K is not school for three and four year olds isn't required. So, right. so there, we don't know ex what that yeah. exact number is. It's unlikely though, we're going to go from 54 to 20. Oh yeah. yeah in yeah, first grade yeah. or kindergarten in a couple of years. That's very typical. Those yeah. three and four year old numbers are very typical for any year. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, and then the, the screener data is in here as well, which is of course the Renaissance star. Um, and Mike has put this in here with uh, the two highlighted, you know, so you can see fall of last year compared to fall of this year um, around what's happening. So a star early literacy, just a reminder that not all kids in the elementary school take that, not even all first graders take that necessarily. It's students who still need, um, we still need information around certain elements um, that are listed there. So our kindergartners do not take that in the fall, I don't believe. I'm almost positive they don't believe take that in the fall because that would be a lot to ask a entering five-year-old to do. Um, so they, that data is for mostly first graders um, coming in. The reading assessment would be most of our second through fourth graders. Um, and what I really like to see here, what I would notice is proficiency of those assessed from fall 2003 was 74% last year to this year it's 85.6%. That's a pretty significant jump. Um, so I really like to see that piece. Um, the other piece is for uh, not tested um, is interesting that there's a jump there too, um, because if a kid is still in this assessment, the early literacy, they're not taking this assessment. So it's a little bit like you've graduated to the next assessment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's harder. Uh-huh. Um, Main Street is also making considerable jumps in uh in their proficiency rates from fall to fall mm -hmm. which is great to see and so is the high school the high school the high school made significant jumps i don't know what kind of um stuff jason's putting in the water to encourage high school students <laughs> to really take that assessment seriously because that's been a challenge in the past yeah you can see the participation numbers yeah uh-huh yeah And then our math scores um, didn't make, really, we're really looking at union and what's happening there for math. We're, we're putting a fine tooth comb on that. Math and Amy Kimball, who is, I saw as a participant, or I'm sorry, Mike and Amy Kimball, who um, I saw as a participant on here, just did a math audit that is, it's really good information for us to look, that we're going through right now and, and trying to decide how, what are we doing? Was our curriculum vertically aligned? Where are our gaps? What are, what are our teachers using for resources that we can do better? How do we increase our teachers' professional knowledge of how to teach math um, so that we can, our kids start achieving differently um, at Union Elementary School in particular? Main Street Middle School, as Julie can attest, I think I saw Julie on here as well, there's significant jumps at Main Street Middle School and our math scores and, and what's happening at Main Street Middle School, which is phenomenal to see. And same with MHS. I know for that Jason can speak to, MHS has changed their systems for support quite a bit in the last, what, two years, Jason? Well, Sorry. <laughs> You're just in the room, so I'm gonna pick on you. Um, both in the last two years, and we adjusted how we administer the um, Brent Star. It's now in math and English classes, which I think just gives us a better sense of um, taking the test more seriously. 
Interesting. What, when were you administrating way. it before? During Solon Block. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Interesting. That's a different shift. Small little technical change. Yeah. Nice. Any questions on the academic data that is presented here? Go ahead, Mommy. I want to say, as a student here in school, at least during your senior year, if you do well in the fall, you don't have to take it again. And I think that is another incentive. <laughs> and I, I think taking it in like the math or the English classroom can definitely help because you're not with like their group you see every day in TA and you can get distracted. But I think that the incentive that you, if you do well, you don't have to take it again, is really helpful because yeah. it's a test. <laughs> it's, just, it's not exactly fun to take, right? Yeah. No. Any other questions, comments about the academic data? I have one. Um, one, I'm really glad to be able to have the statewide assessment. So thanks for, I don't know, pushing the envelope on that. <laughs> Whether we be breaking rules a maybe. little bit. But that's okay. <laughs> um, because it is one of the main things that we have said is an indicator of success in the um for the academic achievement for all. Um, and so I went back and I looked at that and it looks like our under ELA, our growth that we wanna see is 5% each year. And then in math, it's 10% growth. And overall, if you scroll up a little bit more Libby, I think in the report there was, yeah, right here, we went from 71 to 73 in ELA at proficiency and then 50 to 54 proficiency in math overall as a district. Okay. Um, so we didn't quite hit that benchmark that we were looking for in either of those, but we are seeing some growth. So that um, that is definitely moving in the right direction overall as a district. And so I just wanted to make that connection between what we're seeing here in this data report and what we've set as an indicator of success <laughs> um, at the board level. And then I also wanted to ask if it's possible because one of the other components of that indicator of success is across demographics. And this is all just the district as a whole and see if it's, it's possible in the future to get the district as a whole, probably not by grade, I don't think it would be possible, but district as a whole, if that could be broken down by demographics. Nick, do you wanna to talk to the so that we had a long conversation about it. Um, to... Jason's like, if I have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if we're looking at demographics for our whole district, we come across this thing of like small sample size yeah. and, and things like that. Um, but I think essentially if we're looking at student experience and we're here to tell a story about a student experience, the, the size isn't necessarily going to matter all that much. Um, so if we're looking at the whole district and we're breaking things down by demographic, um, that should definitely be something we're looking at, definitely something we're sharing. We'll stay mindful of anonymity, but that doesn't necessarily disqualify us from sharing it. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. But it's not up here now. Is that because we don't have it or? For the academic data? Right. That's a great question. I'm not as well versed in the academic data as to what we do and don't have. It might be a question for Mike. I think what he said when we were having that long conversation, yeah. and Jess, you were there too, so correct me. I think he said that if we were to do it right now, the way the data is broken down, he would have to do it by hand. Okay. So he would have to go in because it's not connected into our system yet because the AOE is still making corrections. Got it. Because it's... um. It's the statewide test. It's not in our panorama. Right. I see. Yeah. And okay. so if he if he had he would have to go in and look at every child okay. one by one because of the state saying that there could still be changes okay. in the data. Okay. And there's no unique identifier that we can line up with our demographics and things like that and make it a little bit easier to just kind of go through. Okay. And and the sample sizes will be large enough that we can can break it down on a district, district wide basis. wide we should be able yeah. to do because yeah. you would never be able to identify who's who district wide mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah yeah but i believe that's what he said we why it's not broken down now okay but maybe 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 possible someday when the, the state yeah so they gave us until midwinter for them to like finalize they, they say they're still making corrections which is okay. why 
technically, I don't think we're supposed to share the district wide scores. I don't okay. think our district, I don't think those scores are going to change all that often. You know, like one or two kids scores may change slightly, sure. which is why I felt confident sharing it. Sure. Um, but the, but because the state hasn't said, yes, this is it, we haven't been able to import it. Got it. Where we can do that ourselves quickly okay. and efficiently. How should we think about the two different tests and what they tell us? I feel like I remember because they're different, right? Which two tests just the to make sure I know? VT cap, the two assessments, the VT cap and the Red Star. Yes. So like when you're thinking about those tests and what you take away from each one of them, are you taking the same thing away from oh, them no. or are they, yeah, like what, what does one do versus what the other one does? Yeah, VT cap is big. Like we would never go into Fiona's scores and say, what do we, for, in VT cap and say, what do we need to do to support Fiona? Because it's, it's a programmatic measure. So that's why when I'm going through it, I'm looking at fourth grade. I'm like, what's in our program that's off there? Right. Like what? Because that's a big programmatic measure. We would okay. we won't look at that kid by kid. It doesn't give us enough information. It's way too broad. Like it gives us context. Like it, it will say like number sense. Well, what part of number sense might the kid be struggling with? That's a pretty big concept. So it doesn't give us enough information to break it down by kid, but it gives us enough information to think about program, yeah. right? Whereas the screener data is a more individual score, right? We're showing you, we don't have, this is the only um, assessment besides the VT cap that we have across the district that we have most kids taking. Right. So which is why we share it with the board, because there's no there's not another data source that we could share. But screener data is um, us looking at very specific kids. And it's the first kind of indicator after the teacher assessment, after teachers eyes are on kids and, you know, they're using their expert opinion. This is kind of the second gate of like, does this kid need support? Um, and do we need to do more diagnostic information to really target in of what kind of support a kiddo might need? Um, so screener data is much more kid-centric and the VT cap is much more programmatic centric. But when we're talking with the board, we really want to think about, like we want you all to know that we're triangulating all this data, right? Like yeah. Julie showed me, um, there is some pieces around screener data that correlates with how mm -hmm. she's noticing kids at MSMS are scoring on the VT cap piece, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting to that. Um, so we can kind of predict, right? What's based gonna on the happen. Other one, based based, on the yeah, one. based on the Ren Star, we can kind huh. of predict what's gonna happen, at least at Main Street Middle School, with the analysis Julie's done, she's discovered that there's a prediction there. It mm -hmm. correlates pretty pretty closely, which is interesting and not something I've dug into before as a superintendent or a curriculum director. Um, so there's there's some interesting things we can do internally to look at that programmatically. Okay. Um, but we're really using Renstar for individual students. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, I appreciate it. Money? Is the VCAP, like, did it used to be called something else? What it was that the S back? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I was like, what different test, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the state changed it. <laughs> so if there's like a, a, a dip in the fourth grade um, math, but it kind of goes across the board. Is there any feedback back that goes back to the to the people that put together the VT cap? Because maybe they're assessing things that aren't in the general district's curriculum for that grade and, oh, I and see what you're saying. yeah that's a conversation that state curriculum directors are really having with the state of Vermont right now because because we weren't the only ones yeah right um and so and and really I go to I'm on the board for the Champlain Valley Valley like professional development um group ESA educational development and that's something all of us are saying around the table. Like we have to focus in on fourth grade math or what happened at fourth grade math for you. Like that's a question that's being asked across the state here. So um, it could be 
a, a test challenge, but I don't want to write off our low score to a test challenge because I think there, we need to, we need to really look at that. It wasn't exactly robust last year either. If it's only down four points from last year. Right. So there is something to the fact that we have to. No, I think that 30% oh, is statewide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's wasn't statewide. that different last year. It was a bit different. It was a bit higher, but it wasn't that different. We still need to look at what's happening at UES with math um, and, and do differently. Because look at the difference between the, our grades three, three and four, and then um, six, seven, eight, right? There's a significant difference there. So we got we to gotta look at that. Just thinking if there's, are these fluctuations in the assessment? Does it make the assessment session like, it's just like less reliable. If you're not testing the same thing every year, it's hard to know where your growth is. Yeah. And this is the second year that they've done this assessment, right? Okay. So it's small yeah. incremental changes maybe can help. Yeah. It could be that they're still looking at it and still developing the assessment then. Who knows? Math night coming it's up. Math night coming up. Everybody go. Everybody go. <laughs> it's Monday, right? Trainers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Should we talk about SEL? Who is that? Not what's next in the data report? I'm ready. Any other questions before? I oh no, chronic absenteeism is next. Yep. So Nick, you want to give an overview of chronic absenteeism? You're already there. Yeah, I decided to stay. I'm going to do the back and forth. Um, so chronic absenteeism update. Uh, hopefully the data that I shared is much more easy to digest than all of the academic stuff. Um, but essentially our chronic absenteeism rate right now as we pull data from October 8th uh, is sitting at about 23%, 23, 24% of students are chronically absent. To be chronically absent at this time of year, um, we are talking about um, missing three days of school. So we're early. Uh, and to be clear, that's still worth looking at and talking about right now is the time where we can actually introduce meaningful intervention and build partnership with families. If we're waiting until, you know, January, February, March, when a student may has maybe has missed 20, 30 days. So it's a lot different conversation than if you miss three days in September. Um, so just kind of wanting to lift that up a little bit. I also pulled apart the numbers uh, for certain student subgroups. So if we're sitting at almost 24% for the whole district, uh, we look at students who may qualify for free and reduced lunch, that's at 30%. So we're seeing an elevated rate uh, for our students who, who may qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, we would also see kind of an elevated rate for our students uh, who may have an IEP as well. We're seeing higher rates than the, the broader school community. Uh, the other subgroup I pulled out here was our multilingual learners, where we're seeing a little bit lower rate of chronic absenteeism for those students. Uh, all in all, as we look at the data this year for the district compared to essentially this time last year, uh, we're pretty close to being like right in the same range. Um, in looking at the numbers today with the updates, it's, it's actually come down quite a bit. Um, so I think I know that one of the big factors across the district was COVID hit hard in September, uh, especially at our middle school. And so we had some pretty significant absences early on, uh, that, um, definitely have an impact on these numbers as well. Also, as we move forward throughout the year, we're talking about missing 18 days over the course of a school year. So I don't expect that that will continue to hold numbers in a certain place. I do expect that that will level out um, and it shouldn't impact our long-term numbers. I'm hopeful. Uh, I did add a few other graphs this time to get a look at kind of, so the green bar is the students who are not chronically absent by grade here. Um, and I also just kind of went into the levels of chronic absenteeism. So, so those students that are chronically absent at what rate uh, are they chronically absent? Is it like just barely or is it pretty significant and extreme? So you can see like there's a there's a dark red bar there that's that's going to indicate our students that have missed 30 percent or more of the school year already this year. Um, so it's you know, we're keeping an eye on these levels and kind of tracking of those students that are tier two, maybe those students that are 10 to 20 percent uh, that they've missed are students that we can definitely kind of get in with early, make that difference early. Those students that are missing 30 plus percent at this point are students that 
Typically, I have a relationship with the family at this point in the year. We're working a lot together, developing plans for re-engagement, um, having hard conversations. But at this point, in a space of partnership is how we're having those conversations. So um, that's kind of how chronic absenteeism will play out this time of year. It's just about building relationships early and often so that we can actually have impact in the long term. Um, I also broke out numbers, similar numbers by school as well, if you were curious about that. Um, but again, overall, it's it's trending pretty similar to where we were last year. Uh, and again, looking at the numbers today, I think it's it's trending a little bit better right now than what we saw last year. So hoping that that will, that will continue. And that grade six, I believe that was the grade that COVID was. was like ravaged through yep. that grade level. Yep. Do you have, um, like, how do we fit in the bigger picture of what schools are dealing with? Is that yeah. kind of typical? Are we doing well? Do we need to work on stuff? Yeah, stuff? this is always a hard question in Vermont to answer because we don't see meaningful chronic absenteeism data published for the state. Um, nationally, what we've seen is pre-pandemic, there was an average of about 15% chronically absent. That was kind of like pre-pandemic numbers. After the pandemic, it was about 30%. So chronic absenteeism doubled uh, from the pandemic, right? So if we look at 21, 22 school year data, nationally, it's like averaging 30% of students are chronically absent, um, which was right where we were. Uh, and in monitoring some of the data, over the past couple of years, there have been some reductions, but they have not been dramatic. So most states have, have dropped two or three percentage points each year over the past two years. So we haven't seen nationally a giant recovery in the way that I think a lot of people were hoping for. Uh, in our district, we've gone from 32%, which was kind of like right in the right coming out of COVID, to last year being at about 20, 21%. Um, and hoping this year that we continue to drive those numbers down. So we in our district have seen a pretty significant reduction. Um, I don't know what our pre-pandemic numbers, because we didn't have great uh, data and tracking chronic absenteeism at that point. Uh, I don't think we're back to pre-pandemic numbers from what I can tell. Uh, I would guess we were probably closer to 15%. Um, but I would say MRPS is making some pretty significant gains uh, over the past couple of years that we haven't seen as dramatic of decreases across the country at like a state level. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Um, what do you think are the biggest contributors to the causes of um, Yeah, it's a multitude. Um, when we look at, so if we look at some of the, the highest rates of chronic absenteeism we have in our district, it would be the subgroup of students who maybe are experiencing homelessness, right? Last year, I think we were at like 66% of students experiencing homelessness were chronically absent uh, compared to 20% of their peers. If we look at um, you know, the one economic indicator that we have uh, in our data, which is that free and reduced lunch rate, um, those students have elevated chronic absenteeism rates compared to their peers. Uh, and um, chronic absenteeism is impacting all of our students. Uh, so there is more overrepresentation in some of our maybe historically marginalized populations. Um, I think you know we can all kind of guess why that would be. We're talking about I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. Getting to school tomorrow is not that big of a priority for me, and that makes sense. Um, that's more of that like tier three level where I'm kind of doing a lot of the work. But there's also what I've seen shift more in our district is mindset. I think mindset is a huge thing for all of our students and families of what it means to be in school every single day and that it matters. The pandemic made it so that being in school every day was like, oh, that's not a thing and I can still learn um, and I can still get what I need because there's systems that are set up for this. Families also realized maybe they're working remotely and it's a little bit easier to have um, a student around on a day that they're taking off. And we would, I think historically, we saw a lot of like, oh, we're just taking the day to go to the uh, theme park or whatever it may be. We're seeing a lot less of that because we're really trying to drive home the point of like, first instruction is critical. Uh, lost instructional time is lost instructional time, regardless of the reason as to why you're missing. I think the more we drive that message home, it's starting to shift the mindset in our community and broader of, yeah, every day counts, every day matters that we're in school. So 
Um, outside of that, the barriers are what you would expect them to be, and they're diverse and and complex. Um, but there's not like one thing I would point to. Nick, could you tell the board and the community some of the great intentional work you're doing with like the UES specials team? To yeah, yeah. So um, really, with with each of our schools over the past couple of years, we've developed kind of an, an attendance chronic absenteeism targeted team. Uh, and at UES, it's the essential arts team. So uh, we've got our, our physical education teachers, our librarian, music, art. Um, we're all coming together and we meet uh, about every other week and we look at the data together. And, and we're talking about this with this team because these are the only teachers in that school that will see every single kid, right? Like our, our grade level teachers, for example, are seeing their students, but our essential arts team are seeing every kid. So we come together and we first we look at data and we talk about, um, hey, does anybody have a good relationship with this student or that student? We develop some interventions together uh, and then we also plan events together. So they're planning enrichment activities. They greet kids at the door. They have morning meetings and they're specifically um, being mindful of students that are coming in that they know because we're looking and reviewing the data have been missing time. And so they're like, oh, OK, like this team has identified People here in our, our team don't feel like they have the strongest relationship with this team. So we will assign like the relationship to be built intentionally um, using things like we call it the two by 10, which is like a great intervention. We spend uh, 10 straight days with a kid for two minutes. The whole point of that two minutes is not to do all the talking. It's not to come in with an agenda. It's just to spend two minutes with the same kid, 10 straight days. By the end, that kid is talking a whole lot more than you are. And you've got a pretty good relationship going. You kind of have to be super intentional about it. It's going to be awkward the first day or two. Um, but we know being anchored in relationships, which is what Jess is going to, going to be talking about too, is what is going to hook these young people to be in our schools, to feel that sense of belonging, and to engage in the classroom. So that essential art team, arts team at UES is doing a ton of work. Um, I was really surprised when Katie brought it up. I was like, yeah, let's try it. And that team has been so excited about it since day one. They're awesome to work with. Um, and they really, really want to like push hard and dig deeper than um, any conversations I'm having anywhere else. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Are there any programs out in the world <laughs> um, that work with the issues around families that are kind of beyond little bit beyond what we can do in some ways to support but you know I I mean we can get agencies to intervene or find you know so other kinds of supports for families but um, is there anything out there that's kind of cutting edge that can help with that because if you can't get to school or you don't have a car you know it's not so yeah um I wouldn't say cutting edge <laughs> um I think there's local organizations doing some pretty incredible things in our community. Um, uh, I would say, you know, when, we, when you're talking about that intensive intervention from Washington County Mental Health to Elevate You Services to the Family Center, those are, you know, three organizations that I go to quite a bit. I think the other reality, too, is like it just takes time and capacity and trust. So while the school is not able, uh, to do all the things that we are asked to do and put in a place to do, for better or worse, those young people and those families come in our doors every single day. And so we still, we are building relationship. We may not be the ones to say, um, here's your appointment and show up at school to get your appointment and everything else. Um, but we can certainly be the ones to hear their stories and lift that up and share that with our partners, share that with our community uh, and advocate, you know, fiercely. And a lot of this stuff is systemic, right? So we have conversations with building leaders in, in our leadership meeting uh, around equity, around what are the barriers that our families are facing. So it's it's hard to answer. We have local organizations for sure. Some of the families that are facing really significant hardship have a, a certain earned distrust in systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, it's time and capacity to spend with them and show up and be consistent uh, and continue to learn from them. I think the folks that are closest to an issue are the folks folks who can most likely solve the issue. So just continue, continue to center 
you know, their voice and their story any way we can. But I, I cutting edge, I would not say we have locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing a great job, by the way. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate what you do too. And I really love the, uh, in the space of partnerships. I'm going to be using that, I mm -hmm. think, wherever I can. Um, can. Have you been able to sort of look at the data around absenteeism specifically with respect to the kids that are transitioned to UES from Roxbury? Um, I can. I have not yet. Um, and I think part of the reason, too, is just looking at the data. Like, I'm in a position where I was fortunate enough to have been a part of Roxbury and I know a lot of the kids. Yeah. And so when I'm looking at the list of names, I know just like offhand, like, okay, you know, I know the student is making a transition. How are they doing? So if they're coming up when I'm talking with the central arts team and we have a student uh, from the Roxbury community, who's maybe coming up in our data, we're going to relationship hard and fast really quick. Um, so uh, I haven't seen, at least uh, I haven't explicitly pulled it apart, but just anecdotally, I haven't seen a large gap a happening yeah. around uh, absenteeism and students that have made that transition this year. Uh, and we are continuing to stay incredibly mindful of if they are bubbling up in, in levels of absenteeism, it's quick action. It's this student likely doesn't have the relationship that some other students that have been here for years have. So we need to work extra hard here. Um, so that's kind of how it's come up. Yeah, my my guess would be numbers would be relatively consistent as compared to last year. Mm -hmm. Would would be my guess because yeah. I imagine it's it's not it's not that big a difference. That's my hope. At least my my hope is that it would be similar to last year for that group. Um, but I would be really interested to know. I don't know if we can get that or maybe the there's a potentially a Roxbury village transition committee meeting yeah um so maybe there it might be a place I don't know I don't see why not I mean I think we're you know we're talking 30 30 plus kids so um yeah it seems like something we could definitely it would, do. I think that we're, we're trying to wrap that up and it would be great to hear some con, con, some good some good news as yeah. part of that process really data. yeah 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 for sure thanks right thank you all right, Jess, now you're up. All right. No, thank you, Nick. Hi, everyone. Jess. Hi, Jess. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'll just launch in. Maybe I'll go um, do a quick sort of overview step by step and just see if folks have any questions after each chart. Um, so the first one is the social emotional learning slash panorama survey. So the survey, as a reminder, is given to all students. Um, for K-1-2, the teacher is filling out the survey. So it's the teacher's perspective. Um, and then once we get to third grade through 12th grade, students are self-reporting both on their social emotional learning proficiencies and also rates of belonging. Um, so UES has had pretty stable with some dips. Um, and so I think that that's something that we're attending to and thinking through, um, particularly around like social awareness is something that caught my eye specifically, but generally pretty stable. And we're seeing that our youngest students, K-1-2, um, their teachers are actually reporting that they're increasing in both of their social emotional learning proficiencies, um, which is good news, of course. Um, and so just to sort of orient folks, right? So I have the fall 2023 data from a year ago and also included this year. Um, this is the fourth time we've given the survey and the first sort of year to year um, comparison that we've had. Um, so if we keep scrolling, MSMS is a little funky, just the way that it's laid out. So fifth graders are um, sort of separated just because the way that the survey is laid out, they have um, third through fifth grade have a slightly different version than the older students based on developmental appropriate language. Um, so just to orient you to that part of the um, chart as well. Um, again, the fifth graders are self-reported um, and we're seeing pretty solid growth in each of the areas um, with sort of self or social awareness um, 
still increasing, but increasing at a lower rate than the other social emotional learning um, proficiencies. So again, something to think about and tend to. And yeah, then what does social, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, what's, what's inside social awareness? Oh, okay. so perspective taking it is um, just so I don't get up. So it's um, relationship skills, uh, connecting with other people, perspective taking those sort of skills. Does that answer that question? Mm -hmm. Um and that tends to be looking at, um, you know, for our fifth graders, right? I, I say it's the one that's grown the least. And um, when compared to other schools for other middle schoolers with or other middle schools with similar characteristics, we're still in the 70th percentile. Um, and it's just something that I, um, it's been surprisingly stubborn around how to support students with that. So um, something that I'm tending to our belonging went up as well, seven points for our fifth graders, which is really, really exciting growth. Um, moving to our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Again, sorry the, for the weird, you know, difference with the middle school and how it's broken up. Um, really solid growth. Again, social awareness. Sorry, I keep pointing out like the one that's sort of the one that stands out to me, right? Because it is the one that hasn't been growing in the same way. Um, and then what was really exciting, and I actually was in um, one of our instructional framework meetings with a group of educators and shouted across the meeting to Julie about this and just the 12 point increase around percentage of students who report a high sense of belonging um, is really, really impressive growth. Um, and teachers, both at the elementary school level and really across our district, have just been doing fantastic work around greeting students at the door, thinking about kids' identities, sharing their own identities, um, and really creating space to have community, especially in the first several weeks of school. And that has been a huge push. And I think we're seeing that. Um, and we're seeing all of the hard work that people from you know, our instructional assistants to teachers, to administrators, to other adults who interact with students are really centering belonging and have that in the forefront of their work, um, which is really exciting to see that students are feeling that and reporting that at least in this metric. Um, as far as our high school, um, again, we're seeing pretty solid growth from last year. Again, this is our first year to year comparison. Um, again, I'm not sure what Jason and Emily and Matt are doing over in the high school, but um, within the 99th percentile, I want to compare it to um, other high schools with similar characteristics. Um, and again, another sort of double digit growth around belonging for our high school and how students are self-reporting um, area or sense of belonging as well. Um, I guess I'll stop there if that feels okay and just ask if anybody look like Scott had a question. I can't see you. Scott, do you have a question? I did, but Libby anticipated it. Um I was I was gonna ask about what social awareness was, but thank you, right. Jess. Yeah. Sorry, I live and breathe these things all the time. So sometimes I just use language like everyone knows it. Um but yeah, other other questions? I don't have a question, but as a parent of a high schooler, I just am blown away by the number of like conscious, proactive belonging activities that happen here. Like it was, I went to high school a while ago, but there was never any of this like intentional community building. And I, it's like really very much feels like it's paramount here. So I'm, I'm not surprised to see these numbers so high because I think it's paying off. Thank you. And thank you, Jason, for centering it. Yeah, no, likewise. Um, I do want to shout out to, we have a social emotional tier one team um, across our schools, but at the high school recently, um, they, in preparation of the survey, uh, planned uh, the circle activity where all of the TAs, and I don't know if the actual high schoolers who experienced this, maybe you want to talk about this because they just <laughs> planned it and then don't actually know how it felt to folks. Um, but they went through, it talked about emotional intelligence and sort of the purpose behind the survey. And then one of the activities they did was um, they had sort of these five core big emotions and then smaller emotions that were sort of synonyms and had to sort out like, is this a sad emotion? Is this 
Um, you know, what is anguish and where does that fit? Um, and I just think that really speaks to how folks are making space for that work and really highlighting it. Um, and again, we're seeing it in our social emotional outcomes, which is really exciting. I'm really pleased with the middle school because adolescents like early teens, that's hard to, hard. it's hard to see, to see those jumps from one year to the next, the middle school. Like I can't wait to see what happens throughout this year because they're working hard. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of it's due to, to great work, but does some of it do a little bit to, because maybe some of the effects of COVID passing through and having, because I think I that was, that's an age group that I think really got hit hard in terms of emotional learning when they were under restrictions. I think it's our, our high schoolers were early middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. But are, are the current middle schoolers coming up like maybe? They were younger. Kindergarten. Yeah. Kindergarteners yeah. were kindergartners when we closed. But but maybe doing a better job of, of middle schooling now that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would sort of expect that to <laughs> maybe be reflected in our belonging. Um, our social emotional learning needs, I think, are generally feel higher than they have been, and that hasn't been going away. I think we're we have a lot more students who need more support with social emotional learning, and that doesn't seem to be ebbing as we get more distance from COVID. Okay. Um, so I think maybe that could, that could be reflected in belonging. And I would also say there's been a lot of intentional effort um, from our teachers, from our instructional assistants who are there every day with kids um, and are showing up for them and taking time to, you know, create space for their identities and thinking about how do we create a classroom that everyone feels a sense of belonging. So I also want to like, just like shout out individual teachers who are doing this work and really like committing to this work our, and our instructional assistants, you know, I was with them last Friday and we talked about some of the belonging data and, you know, they are often the folks who are supporting students who are the, in some ways, the least connected, right? They're working with students who have the most challenges in accessing their education and they just deeply care for students and are actively trying and are there with you being so thoughtful and so um really just reflective around how can we continuously improve this um so i just want to shout out the folks who are in front of kids doing us work too and that's definitely a, that's a systems change that we've made since we have the ability to do so with Justin's position now. We we didn't do that work with um, instructional assistants prior to having Justin's position. So that's a significant systems change that I think is pretty positive. We've gotten pretty positive feedback around. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I guess I'll just move on. So this uh, data in the first chart is sort of, it's several questions that feed into sort of the overall percent favorable. This chart is a zoomed in version of specifically the question, when you are at school, how much do you feel you belong? Um, so this is the direction, or this is the one question that most directly sort of answers how much do folks feel like they belong when they show up here. Whereas the belonging percentage in the previous chart is sort of an overview of several, like five questions that students are asked. And I feel like having those balanced is really helpful because they think that they get at different facets of what belonging feels like. So that's why the percentages are a little different in this chart than the one above. Um, I, I Again, right, we're looking at overall, um, UES went from 78 to 75. So I think like relatively stable, a slight decrease. Um, and then again, across um, MSMS and MHS are seeing pretty significant gains. Um, I will say that Panorama did um, re they tweaked some of the language in their survey recently, which was actually really welcomed news. Um, we had last year gotten a lot of feedback from teachers and folks who were with students while they were taking the survey, feeling like 
oh, do students really understand like what belonging is? Like, are they able to really understand the question? And Panorama being fantastic, um, I think heard that from a few, several places and actually worked through a process to make their questions more accessible and developmentally appropriate. Mm. Um, with that, they sent out uh, an article that basically said, like, because of this, you may get more accurate scores. And so expect some of these scores to go down. And despite that, um, I, I'm hopeful that that means right, we have a more accurate um, representation of how students feel like they belong because the questions are more reflective of like their age or understanding um, and feel a little bit more accessible. Um, and with that, we're still seeing a pretty intense increase. So I'm not sure if that sort of better understanding leads to a more accurate, um, you know, student self-reporting rates of belonging. Um, also broke it down um, by demographics. Um, so I would say things that stood out to me here are um, our students who are accessing special education generally have lower rates of belonging across the board outside of grades six, seven, and eight. Um, so that's something that stood out quite a bit to me. Um, and then race is another area that where there are some pretty big um, gaps between student, different students and based on their race. Um, most notably for me, um, and I gave, you know, Jason and I have talked a little bit about this and Emily and I have talked about this, just are students who are Black, 20% um, responded favorably to that question, meaning that they belong completely or belong quite a bit. Um, where 64% of white students um, said the same thing at MHS. So I think that's something we certainly need to attend to as um, both a leadership team and as a district, thinking about how do we um, really ensure and pay attention to all students feeling like they belong when they walk through, walk through the doors. Um, and then at MSMS, there was a bit of a gender difference yeah. between our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade um, people who identify as female versus those who identify as male mm -hmm. um, was something that stood out to me as well with 59% of um, people who identify as female feeling strong sense of belonging versus 75% of those who identify as male. So uh, again, just something to tend to um, and think about as we, you know, really uh, dive into more nuanced uh, focus on belonging. Um, I guess I'll pause there for a second. For you, yes, is this third and fourth graders that are reading this because you talked about um, it was facilitated by teachers for first and second grade and third and fourth graders could take this themselves? Yeah, so great question. So for K-1-2, their teachers are actually answering questions about students. Okay. For that. Um, that's all part of the, that still gets com combined with the third, fourth graders that are answering it themselves. So it's, se it's, it's, it's separate, which thing. is why, yeah. So it's separate, which is why I reported it separately. So sorry, good question, Rhett. I think I may understand what you're asking now. Um, so K-1-2 aren't included in the rates of belonging. Um, questions about that. Yeah, sorry about that. I caught up there. Um, so that's a great question, right? So they, our teachers aren't responding for K-1-2, gotcha. um, their rates of belonging, because I'm not sure how. That's hard, yeah. I would, yeah. You would that's do why, that. That's why I asked. Also wondering, what week did this go out? And was it the same across the whole district? It was. So it was the week of the 30th of September. So like okay, that so first good, week. A good four and a half weeks. Yeah. Five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. We pushed it back a little bit from last year too, so that um, we could get a little bit more of a sense of students. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really appreciate this this breakdown here and that you've shared this with us to particularly around belonging because it is another one of our priority areas. Um, and I am you know not glad to see the numbers 
that are the discrepancy for students who um, access special education, but I'm I'm glad you named that. Um, what do you have any sense of what might be behind that? Yeah, I mean, I think unfortunately there's still a lot of societal stigma um, around disability, needing extra help, um, not being able to access and like do school independently in general, particularly um, once folks become more aware of that. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, at UES last year, it was actually flipped for 504 students on 504s and students um, accessing special education. So a year ago, oh. um, students who are accessing special ed actually had an higher rates of belonging than their peers who are not accessing special education, huh. which sort of makes sense, right? At the elementary school level, you get an extra adult, right? Like you have a person, um, whereas our 504 students, um, students accessing 504, I apologize, um, were flipped. And we were seeing that students with, with 504s were reporting less sense of belonging. Um, so that is something that sort of stuck out to me just because it was the opposite trend last uh -huh. year. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think unfortunately there's still a lot of a sort of a stigma um, and okay. because of that, and I don't want to speak for students who are accessing special education by any means, but I think that they're sometimes is some shame around needing extra support in order mm -hmm. to access education when your peers don't. Again, I don't want to speak for other people's experiences, um, but that is the experience that I've had working with students um, mm -hmm. who are accessing special education. And you um, you do this assessment three times a year, right? You'll do it in the winter and you'll do it in the spring, just like our academic. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be interesting to see how it changes over the year too. And this is like sort of caught off the presses. So we haven't had a ton of time. I was talking to Libby about this while we were both walking here, right? The survey happened the first week in October um, and then we closed it and had to do some of the analysis. So we haven't had a chance to quite debrief this a lot with you know, our social emotional learning team or our SEL equity teams yet. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to analyze and problem solve and think about like, what are the interventions that we're going to put in place based on um, this data? Because we did start the year doing a lot of that work based on spring. Um, so it'll be right. nice to have some updated data now that we're, gosh, like a month and a half into school, two months into school. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to say, I appreciate the percentiles that are in the um more broad questions that go along with it so we can know because you might look at 57 percent of high school students saying that they feel a strong sense of belonging as not that great but to see the context that really that's pretty much in line with their peers nationally it helps it make a little bit more sense of course it would be nice if it was higher than 57 percent, but it helps it make more sense i think yeah, I think it's nice to situate because as we um, were sort of talking about this and helping people unpack uh, belonging data, I think especially mm -hmm. last year, I think there was a lot of that concern around like developmentally, like middle school, you know, um, or high school. Um, so I think it's helpful to have the national sort of norm and know that millions of kids across the country take this. And so we sort of can kind of compare and also obviously we want that number to be higher and particularly want to pay attention to the opportunity gap around and the differences based on demographic around how students are experiencing belonging. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, and then um, our next is around behavior. So I did the whole number of reported incidents, though I'm not sure how helpful that is, right? Because you're comparing whole year data versus just the past month and a half-ish. Um, so also included the average per day. Um, so fairly stable. We went down a little bit at MSMS and MHS as far as reported incidents. Um, and then looking through the, the data as well, we saw a slight increase um, in physical aggression at our elementary school level, as I mentioned. Um, 
So that's something we're attending to and sort of thinking about how do we best use our robust social emotional learning team at UES to meet those needs. Um, but our HHB rates have been down and our rates of school suspension are down a little bit compared to this time last year. Um, which for me, anybody who sort of has talked to me for all of one minute knows um, sort of the risk rate of being suspended and out of school. Um, and as Nick talked about, right, being away from instruction is really risky and puts you at risk for other um, longer term outcomes that are we don't want to see for our students. So that for me is um really positive, um, knowing that, right, we're not just like not suspending kids, we're thinking about other ways to both respond, support, um, and, and, you know, prevent it in the future. So I think that's just a sign of some of our social emotional learning systems, I think, working. Um, and again, I talked about HHP already. Um, a little bit. Major physical aggression incident 37 already. Is a bummer. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it is nine more than last year, um, which is something that is impacting a small number of teachers and people mm -hmm. who are support people. Um, I think every year we have young new people who have never been in school before who are learning how to be around people who mm -hmm. have never had maybe a routine or a schedule. Um, and then we also have a handful of students who have pretty high support needs and they're really important valued members of our community. And we need to figure out how to think creatively around how to wrap them in a way that's going to work for both them, their peers, and of course, um, the, uh, the adults as well. Um, so that is something that sort of we see the beginning of every year as we think about how and figure out students and how to best support them. <laughs> And I think we're seeing a bit of a increase right now in the types of needs that really little people have. Thank you. I also recall those numbers being different at the two buildings last year. Um, and so that is likely also a factor. I was wondering about, um, first, I wanted to really look at the referrals um, of incidents, especially at the high school, which seem to be decreasing by 50% or more year after year, close to it. That's a really pretty awesome. And that's where I would guess that kids are really able to sort of take in what you've been sharing with them. Um, you know, most, most like you're sharing some high level stuff and they're getting it. It looks like that's what that looks like to me. I'm wondering about, um, this may be more of a question for you, Libby, but I don't, I, I was actually part of the committee that recommended you to be hired. And um, yeah. yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember, I remember, I remember it well. Um, and, um, but the, my understanding of the prior superintendent was, we don't know, you know, there was kind of a, wasn't great, but there wasn't a lot of like, what was good, what was not good. And what I'm wondering for the district is, as we see gains in these areas, are there ways that we can document, I'm looking at the memoir thing, I don't know if that's a good example, but um, are there ways to have, to have a record that helps the district maintain gains or the lessons learned from gains, the lessons learned from challenges for, people that may take your place 10 years from now or your place 10 years from now or any of your places. Maintain I mean, institutional knowledge, is that what you Yeah, mean? I guess so. I mean, I don't know that there's necessarily a mechanism for that. I don't know if anyone's asking you for that. We're asking you to turn an aircraft carry in a particular direction and make it go and deal with fires and COVID and all the things. Um, but like True. this, I, that idea of like um, having experiences that could be helpful for you 32, they could be, protect, you know, you're, 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 you're maybe having experiences that could really be helpful for future administrators, other districts. Um, I just, I want to throw that out there because it's not a hard ask, but um, I see, I see good work and good games. And I think my answer to that, Brett, 
is that um, systems take a long time to develop. Um, and we've worked incredibly hard on Boulder SEL in our academic systems, particularly in the last few years coming out, right, of COVID. We, in the beginning of my tenure, we spent a lot of time on culture and climate and what do we believe for kids? And then COVID hit real quick. <laughs> and in some ways that sped up our systems work. Mike will tell you it sped up our curriculum work real quick because we realized that we had to really target what were our priority standards. Mm -hmm. um, and we it enabled us to hire the human resources we need to for supports for supporting kids who struggled. So um, our systems development, we haven't changed that tune, right? Like there's been a process for that systems development. Um, certainly adding Jess's administrative position because of our SEL needs was was paramount to systems development in the SEL world. Um, and I think my hope is that it get when I win the Powerball um, and resign quickly. Yeah. Then <laughs> not, not too quickly. <laughs> because of my multi-million dollar status now, um, that you built, we've built the system where this is how we do things now. And it's not owned by Jason as the principal, right? Or Jess as the social emotional learning coordinator. It's owned by the team of teachers who own the work and want to do it this way, right? I think if somebody went into UES right now, for instance, and said, like, if he resigned today and the next principal came in and said, yeah, we're not doing professional learning community anymore. You all on your own. Like, you don't, you don't meet as a team. I think there'd be a revolt yeah. around classroom teachers. Like, classroom teachers would be like, nope, this is what we do. You know, this is how, this is how we function here because the teachers own that so well. Um, same thing for like our guiding coalition and teacher leadership teams with our principals. I think if somebody came in and be like, well, you're not doing those anymore. You don't have to do those anymore. Then teachers would be like, but that's our voice for decisions. That's how we move work here. That's how we make decisions. So there's starting to be that ownership of it. Um, Jim Collins and Good to Great calls it the flywheel starts yeah, spinning I faster. That analogy before and um, I think that's truly happening in all of our buildings. It looks different in each of our buildings, which it should, because they're different places with different people in it and different kids in it. Um, Jason's staff has very intense, good discussions that tends to take a little longer for some change efforts. But when they happen, they happen with such ro like robustness. Whereas um, Julie's got MSM going, MSM is going, tell me how high I got to jump. You know, like they're, they're really, they jump on a little bit quicker. So it's just really fascinating to watch different staff and how they work. And, and we have a leadership team now who understands their staff beautifully and can really move them forward. So I think there's some ownership that's happening now that wasn't previously there. And so hopefully we can continue that. So when new leadership comes in, this is how we do business and you're hiring the person to match how we do business, right? <laughs> Whereas um, the difference would be a person coming in and saying, you need to develop the systems because there aren't any, right? Or they're not as robust as they could be. What I love about our leadership team too is that you heard a lot from Jess is that we're not... Um, necessarily like we're looking at the spots that are like huh why is that happening right like we need to we need to know more about that we need to be more intentional we need to take some action about it instead of just admiring it i've been on lots of teams where we admire data quite a bit and this is not a team that does that they go after it sounds good to me Thank you, everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any more questions for the group before we move to policy monitoring? Do you mind yeah. one more, which is that the the page eleven, the last page of the report, where it gave us the overview of opportunity gaps rather than the achievement gap. What was a new addition? And I was just curious to say to about why it was included in this report. We had, um, so our core team, which is myself, Jess, Nick, um, Peggy Sue, and Christina, and Mike, had a lot of, because we're trying to change the language from achievement gap to opportunity gap. Uh -huh. um, yeah. and, Good to know. And, and we were we are having a really um, 
long and good conversation around how do we show that because that's been our request to the board, right? How you of showing that um, over time and and how do we use the work we're doing with discrepancies and all of that kind of stuff to mm -hmm. talk about it publicly. Um, and and because and it was quite honestly, I think me saying, wait, hold on, tell me about the difference, you know, again. And so because we had some of those questions, I had some of those questions. Uh -huh. I, I figure the community also would have some of those questions. Uh -huh. So just to be as articulate as we can and have that information for not only our benefit, but also the board's benefit. And so when community members ask, you can say, got it. Here, let's look at it. You're just helping us keep up with yeah. you. <laughs> and kind of you guys. <laughs> I also noticed it was in Roots and Wings. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're trying to really change language. Uh -huh. um, so what is more an equitable framework because opportunity gap is talking about systems and structures that systemically have been mm -hmm. um, oppressive for marginalized communities, whereas achievement gap puts it more the blame more on the student than the child. Mm -hmm. Would you guys want to add anything more onto that? Yeah. This has a mild philosophical. I mean, I, I get I get the difference and I get the language, but I mean, ultimately, you know, the opportunity gap is kind of the cause of the achievement gap. And isn't there still a desire to to ensure that achievement moves up as well? That that we address the achievement difference by addressing the opportunity difference. Does that make sense? Yes. I think the the work would be if we can name and figure out the parts of our system that we are in control of, that is a barrier to student success then instead of just admiring the achievement number, then we're really going to make strides. Nick looks like he wants to jump yeah, in there. Yeah, Tavis, that, like, come over to the mic. About, <laughs> I think if you're talking about opportunity versus achievement and how you frame everything that you talk about. So bottom line, right? We want young people to be learning at high levels. Yeah. Agreed. Um, how we go about making those moves when we talk about it as an achievement gap, it tends to put the onus on the kids yeah. or the families that have those. Uh, when we talk about opportunity gap and we we keep it, it's how do we provide more opportunity? It, it's the mindset shift of like, the, it actually is in our control. It's not a student's demographic that causes them to perform at a certain level. It's that the system is built to not serve these demographics well. Um, and so there's not the same opportunity for young people that may have this identity or that that identity. So taking out that achievement is like super intentional because it's not them, like it's us, we gotta change. And Nick's done, Nick's added, like talking about adding Jess's position, but adding Nick's position as well. And with the knowledge Nick has around, he doesn't just work with our families. I don't mean to put that just there. He doesn't do the phenomenal job he does with families who are our hardest to reach, which he does do. He's added a level of data literacy to our leadership team that was not there before. Um, so what, two years ago, we added you to our leadership team? conversation for yeah, years yeah. and it, it's made like a significant difference about how we talk about this this stuff because of Nick's contribution and his knowledge base it's awesome awesome no thank you it's helpful anything else I will just say usually special education's on this we're having a special education state of the state I think in two board meetings okay. so that's why Peggy Sue's work is not or the, the special education work is not on this. Yeah, well, thank you hugely. This is really great data and um, and yes. gives us a, a really good snapshot of kind of where we're at and where we're done. So really appreciate it. It's super important. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much for thanks being for, here tonight. Yeah. Um, do you have a motion to approve three policy monitoring reports, B3, alcohol and drug-free workplace, B4, drug and alcohol testing for transportation employees, and C2, student alcohol and drugs? I move to approve the monitoring reports for B3, B4, and C2. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion, questions? 
All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, now moving into executive session and it looks like uh, Anna has, yep. Yeah. Just because I, we're not gonna come back from executive session, I just wanted to make an announcement for the public that to say thank you for to the 268 people who have already filled out our survey, yes. asking for input on um, the, the ideas for what we do for how to handle the future of Roxbury Village School and make an appeal if you're not one of those 268 people to please go to mrpsvt.org a little and click the little pop-up box to learn more about it and take the two question survey. Yes. And yes, no, thank you. And and we we are gonna return the just briefly from the executive session. Can we ask how that oh we are we, we have to that's we have to adjourn an open session. Right, but we don't have to be on camera. No. No, yeah. Right. Have to be on camera. Right. Will the Google surveys um data presentation tool be be sort of presented to the public as is, or does a little bit need to be changed or sort of just the graphs, not the specific answers or pretty much the graphs are what will be available, publicly available? We'll probably show the graph. And then since there's a lot of qualitative feedback, we'll probably like just pull themes pull as we've done in the past. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just That will help with context for what's on the graph or maybe give us, if there's anything like that's more of an, uh, sparks ideas or whatever that comes out of that that we could share with the public out of the box yeah excellent um does anyone want to read the uh, motion i'll do it all right thank you i move to enter executive session for the purpose of the evaluation of a public officer under the provisions of title one section 313 a three of vermont statutes Evaluation of a public officer or employee. Do Second. I, any discussion, questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great.